tribe. What's going on, guys? Thank you for tuning in. We have a wonderful show for you today, and we're very excited to let you know, if you've read the description, you already know, but that we have Dr. Harville Hendricks and his wife, Dr. Helen Hunt, on today's show. And you may have heard of them. If not, we'll tell you a little bit about them. They are the co-creators of Imago Relationship Therapy and of the social movement called Safe Conversations, which we get into today. And they're really just an international internationally renowned couple who are therapists, educators, speakers, activists, and New York Times bestselling authors. There's 10 books, including the classic, we've mentioned it on the Mm -hmm. show many times, Getting the Love You Want, A Guide for Couples, have sold more than 4 million copies. And Harville has appeared on Oprah. They just call it Oprah, right? Not the Oprah Winfrey show. Anyways. Yeah. 17 17. times. Yeah. And he kept going back on because he has so much amazing knowledge and information. And this is really cool. Helen was installed in the Women's Hall of Fame. Didn't even know they had that (laughs) at the Smithsonian Institute. And they have six children and seven grandchildren. So we are honored to have them on the show today where we talk about their program, Safe conversations and what that really is is just a a certification and an educational program that teaches individuals and couples how to have dialogue that's productive and really create more love and understanding in relationships. And if you are maybe listening to the show and you're wanting to learn new tools to communicate with your partner, they give us some really great step-by-step tools. Procedures. Yeah, procedures yep. to have a productive dialogue with your partner. So even though Chase and I have been doing this podcast forever, we often forget how to do those correct procedures. We can't say it enough. Having good communication in your relationship is not easy. And I think sometimes we, we think it is, or we think it should be. Right. And yeah. they really have this, this outline uh, of a way to think about a dialogue between yourself and your partner or your business partner or your mom, your dad, your kid. Uh, it can be applied to all those things. That's really valuable and interesting. And they shared uh, a lot more, some really cool tips. Uh, one we've never heard that we really love. So we'll let you get that in the show. And as always, we appreciate you guys tuning in and listening. Today's episode is brought to you by our online course, Spark My Relationship. Do you guys want to create more passion, improve your communication, and build a stronger, more intimate connection with your partner in less than 90 days? Yes. Sign me up. (laughs) Then you guys need to check out our online course, Spark My Relationship. It is an online course, like I mentioned, that we created with over 15 therapists and psychologists to bring you guys the strategies marriage therapists teach their clients. We talk about it on the show. Relationships take work. Sometimes they function pretty easily and you coast along. But we've found the reality is, is you have to do work sometimes and to make them better, to change them so that they're more satisfying for both partners. And you've made it here. You've made it to listening to our show. So you guys probably already know that a little bit. But what you might not know are the specific tools and exercises that you need to create those lasting and positive improvements in your relationship. And like Chase said, change does not happen on its own. It takes hard work. And that's why we created the course. Spark One Relationship is designed to infuse your life and relationship with fresh passion, skills, and wisdom. And it's a self-paced journey that's perfect for turning up the heat, having some fun together, and revolutionizing your intimacy and communication. And just some tools and strategies that the course includes is to how to eliminate unhelpful old habits, develop mindful awareness to help improve your stress management, learn healthy and successful communication tools, create a deeper and more intimate bond, and strengthen your couple microculture, which you will find out what that is. 
uh, in the future together. So for our listeners only, we're offering a special of $100 off the course. Visit sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock to unlock your discount. And there is a 30 day money back guarantee. So there really is no reason to not give it a try. So go to sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock for a hundred dollars off. Hi, Harville and Helen. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for asking us. We are delighted to be here. Hi, Sarah. And looking forward to it, Sarah. <laughs> yes. Today, we're going to talk about your program, Safe Conversations. And you both have done so much amazing work in the space of relationships. And we're so honored to have you on the show. And what you're doing with Safe Conversations is such a great and important thing. So why don't we start by having you tell us in our audience what Safe Conversations is and why you guys felt drawn to start this program? Um, let me mention that um, Harville was the person on Oprah 17 times uh, that made a book famous, Getting the Love You Want. And the reason Oprah kept asking him on is this stuff works. <laughs> so mm -hmm. a lot of people to have a better relationship, they feel like they need to fix the two people in the relationship. And we don't see it that way. We invite any couple that has made a commitment of exchanged a vow to be married, to be a couple, realize that we have a new definition of relationship. Uh, to have a successful relationship, um, you need to realize a relationship is two people and the space between them. And people go, well, that's ridiculous. There's nothing there. It's empty. It's, it's, it's invisible. There's nothing there. And we go, you know, it's an energy field. And for the, when the energy field between two people is safe, people connect. And if there's anxiety between two people, people get anxious and they sort of um, are afraid to talk or they get anxious and they start yelling. <laughs> and anyone where there's anxiety in the space between can deal with any <clears throat> issue that creates more safety in the between. And so when there's safety, people connect. And that's why we call this safe conversations. And so the new definition of relationship People need to realize it's how the look in your eye, how you talk, uh, what it, how you raise an issue that may be a problematic issue. But basically, four things will keep the relationship safe. It's number one, the tools of dialogue. Number two, um, converting a frustration into a request, creating empathy, um, um, Number three, zero negativity and uh, identifying childhood challenge. And affirmations. And affirmations. Yes. So to pick up on that, I think that it'd be helpful to know something of the on-ramp and the history of Safe Conversations. And so let's uh, start with that um, so that we can put it in uh, what Helen just said in a historical context. So mine and Helen's lane in the bowling alley for the past uh, 30 something years has been couples, uh, couples therapy and couples workshops and training uh, couples therapists or couples therapists to do Imago relationship therapy, which is the name of our couples therapy. And we have about, parenthetically, about um, 2,500 uh, 2, uh, therapists trained in 61 who are practicing in about 61 countries. So um, about, um, it's years pass as I get older, they pass faster than I realized, <laughs> but uh, I decided that I would start retiring from active clinical work probably about 15 years ago now. And because uh, I was old enough to do that, I think I was about 65 at that point. And 
we had a kind of conversation. It was kind of a download and an epiphany that, um, one, couples therapy. Well, let me back up and say, I, I, Helen is a is a is an activist, and she is an entrepreneur, and does all kinds of things to help the world, and at, at the big levels. And I became aware, and I became sort of a social activist because of being with Helen. And I was aware that the work we were doing in therapy uh, would never change the world. It would help many, many, uh, and has helped many, many thousands, and now we know millions of people with their personal relationship. But the structures that help those relationships have their difficulty were social and cultural, and that it wouldn't help with that. So we discovered that the dialogue process, which was the active agent in couples therapy, could be, um, could be taught to anybody, and anybody would have a better relationship, whether it was their personal relationship or their work relationships or their parenting relationships, if they uh, would learn how to engage in a different way of talking that, that was at that time called Imago Dialogue. So we decided to extract that uh, process from the clinic and bring it to the culture. And we renamed it Safe Conversations and began to um, teach uh, workshops to anyone, whether they were uh, couples or uh, or not, or in other non-intimate couple situations, the safe conversations dialogue process. So that's our big um, that's our big on ramp into safe conversations. And you were, I think, uh, that we met you through that process, and that we are, we have a big goal, social goal, which is to teach this process um, and all of its particular details to the world, to the planet. And we mean literally that, that in the next uh, 30 years, we anticipate teaching Safe Conversations to 3.8 billion people. Um, and that's the tipping point of the world's population in 2050. So at that point, we are hoping that we will shift from an individualistically oriented uh, competitive culture to a relational civilization where we will uh, all experience more freedom and equality and diversity uh, and and uh, connectedness. So that's kind of the big 90,000 foot overview about what it is. That's the context within which Helen then puts the specifics about the, the, the uh, four pillars of safe conversation. So let's throw it back to you because that's a lot of talking without an interruption. <laughs> no, no. Thank you for sharing that. And we love that overview and that ambition towards this project because communicating and understanding each other is such important, an mm -hmm. important thing in our relationships and societally. So uh, thank you for having done that work for so many years and now transforming it into this way that it can reach so many more people. So yeah, let's dive in and talk about maybe the tools of dialogue and what that looks like. And so we can apply that to our personal lives. Yeah. So I'd love to do that. And Helen, so I'll start with that. Or you sure. Want to? Okay. So, <clears throat> so dialogue is a technical term that talks, uh, basically means talking, um, talking across to each other in, in contrast to Another term called monologue, which is one person talking down to another person, or one person has the truth and everybody else has to learn it. That's some. That's the um, that's the monological kind of talking, which has been what people have done for all of humankind. Is there's a there's there's the person who knows things and the people who need to learn them, whereas dialogue uh, establishes a different way to talk in which people who are in a conversation are equal. So they're on the same level. And that equality uh, changes their relationship from it being sort of could be intimidating or dangerous to being safe. And so when it's uh, equal and safe, then people can let their defenses down and be vulnerable. And when you're vulnerable, then you can connect. And then when you connect, you feel like you belong 
not only to this person and with this person or this group of people, but you belong in the larger sense with a capital B, you belong to the community, you belong to your culture, you belong to humanity, and we think you also belong to the cosmos. So this this is a structured way to talk in which we uh, invite people to uh, use what we call sentence stems when they are engaging in a conversation. And if you if you want to initiate a conversation, that you learn how to how to start a conversation. Most people most of us start a conversation by just walking into the room and starting to talk, and we don't pay much attention to is the other person what the other person is doing. So the the so the first um, concrete skill is that when you want to talk, you you ask if you can. We call it making an appointment. And that you make an appointment honors boundaries. And the boundary is uh, the other person. Like, for instance, if I walk into a room and Helen's in the room and I walk in and saying, Helen, I just have something I have to tell you and blah, 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 blah. What I now know is that Helen is not waiting in the room for me to talk to her. She's running a movie in her own mind of her life or what's going on for her. And if I walk in, I impose my movie on her movie. That's going to frustrate her in some way. Uh, It may irritate her. And and um, and and or she may be just compliant and say, okay, um, uh, what is it you want to say? But if I go in the room and say, Helen, are you available for me to share something with you? Then she can decide if she is available uh, right now or if she's not. She can say, you know, well, I'm not available right now. Be available in uh, 10 minutes or in an hour. I'm in, in, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I'm now honoring her boundaries. So when she uh, is available, then I know that she has, is giving me her full attention and that I'm talking to somebody who's listening rather than to somebody who's still running her movie on the side. So this is a way to avoid tension and conflict and to start off in a connected place because she's made herself available. So we think this is one of the most important skills that couples can have, but also anybody, whether in couples or in a corporation or anywhere, um, that's the honor about. It says, now a good time to talk or are you available for a conversation about? And you give them the topic and they know that, well, it's a, it's a conversation about Having a cup of coffee, that may be one thing, but if it's a conversation about the budget or the um, uh, when are we going to have sex or whatever, that you may not be available, you know, for that. So you want to say, it's now a good time to have a conversation about uh, can we go have a cup of coffee or about um, how are we going to handle our budget? So that's the first thing um, is to establish boundaries with is now a good time. And so Helen, I'll just go through these and you chime in when, when you want to, that, that when, when you um, uh, have said I'm available, then I'll start talking. And then when I say something, uh, Helen will say, well, let me see if I got that. So now she's going to do a mirror. And the mirror is to say back to me, with accuracy, what I said to her as she heard it. So she'll say it back, reflect it back. And her goal is to reflect it back in what we call a flat mirror, exactly. But most of us have a little distraction going on and it may not be exactly right. So she will mirror it back and say, Arvo, did I get that? And I may say, yeah, you got that. That was perfect. Or I might say, well, sort of. And then she'll say, well, can you tell me what I missed? And then she'll mirror it back. By the way, the listening rate sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but we think we heard what our partner said. Yeah. Uh, and But we, what is the a statistic? For- the, the statistics are about 25. There, there's two. There's a 30. There's a, some research that's gotten into 30 and some at about 20. So we say maybe wow. 25%. Of what you hear, do you actually hear accurately? So there's mirroring the partner who speaks, uh, validating and empathy, 
uh, empathizing with them. But and we call these sentence stems. It's a three. The dialogue is a three step process: mirroring, validation, and empathy. Yeah. But uh, it really takes. Um, you have to work <laughs> at hearing what your partner says because yeah. most of us don't realize that we didn't hear it yeah. correctly because the partner goes, well, that's not actually what I said. Yeah. And so um, it's a beautiful process. It slows talking down where two people can truly connect yeah. because the person sending the message feels respected uh, that the other person doesn't just come in and react to yeah. what they said. Which is why it's important to say that I get it which is what we call an accuracy check. Uh, because with a 25% accuracy listening, and this listening rate is when you're not upset. If you're upset, the listening rate uh, for people who do this kind of research is zero. Wow. Get nothing right if you're upset. Your brain is too, too, um, too, too anxious to receive accurately signals from the outside. So, but, so you check it out. And this sounds a little tedious, but what it does is prevent a lot of misunderstanding. So let's say, so Helen says, well, yeah, you got it now. So the next step in a conversation is to say to her, is there more about that? We call that showing curiosity. Now, the, the thing that this um, prevents is in many conversations, once somebody says, well, did I get it? And Helen would say, yes that my natural inclination is to say, well, I think it's so-and-so and I think it's different. I want to talk about me now. But if I do that, then I push Helen aside and I switch it to me. And so that's going to not meet some of her need to be listened to. So, um, so I'll say instead, is there more about that? And she will say, well, um, well, there is more about that. And so she'll uh, pay attention to her mind and to her feelings and say, what I'm, what I'm feeling when I talk about this or what I'm thinking when I'm talking about this is, and then I'll mirror that. And then I'll say, well, is there more about that? And she'll say, well, let me see. Yeah, there's one other thing. Uh, so I'll mirror that. And then I'll say, is there more about that? And she will say, well, no, I think that's it. So I will say, okay. Uh, well, let me see if I've got it all, which is now a summary. And this is really important. So if I've got it all, you said A, B, and C. Did I did I get it all? Is that a good summary? And she'll say, well, well, you actually you left out D. Oh, and so you also said D. So that's the kind of first set of sentence stems that we call mirroring, that it has those four movements to it. And you may want to talk about validation. Well, what I would like to mention, and then I almost feel like we should stop and hear from you. <laughs> the dialogue process, uh, the first thing when people are communicating in a relationship, when someone says, is now a good time uh, for me to share, you a, share with you a thought about so-and-so, which is really, really important. If the other person says yes, or the other person might say, you know, I'm really tied up now. I'm finishing an email. Can we do it in 30 minutes? Or can we do it? If I'm really busy now. I need to focus on so-and-so. Could we do it tonight? Like it's seven o'clock? Or the person doesn't have to do the dialogue when the person asks for an appointment. And when they do say, I'll do it at seven o'clock tonight, the the person who wants to do the dialogue knows the other person will give them their undivided attention. Um, and, and so the first thing a couple learns is the person talking is called the sender. They send the message. And the second person is then called the receiver. And the receiver, as Harville said, mirrors the person back uh, they validate, uh, which all they all they have to say is that makes sense from your point of view. You don't say from your point of view, but from where, given what, given how you see things, what you just said makes sense. Uh, and then you move into empathy. I can imagine that you would feel better mm -hmm. if I did what you, um, what you're talking about 
is that the feeling? And you check out how the person is feeling as they send the message. Um, yeah, and that's if you are having a conversation like this is 10, 15, or 20 minutes. Now, the great thing about this is that we encourage people to use these sentence stems like one at a time. Like if you were at a, uh, at a party or uh, somewhere, you could say to somebody, it's not a good time to share with you something I just heard. Uh, instead of just walking up to people. So you don't have to do the whole structure. You can do it what we call spontaneously in any conversation um, to, to integrate uh, each of them into, into your life, essentially. A very important thing is that this is a process to use if it's, what are we going to do this evening? You know, it's now mm -hmm. a good time to mm -hmm. talk about our evening plan or our weekend plans. Mm -hmm. And it is also the very same structure to use if you're near divorce and you're very upset with each other and you all may divorce, but um, right. But maybe the la like Harvel and me, maybe we announced to the world we were divorcing at one point. We announced it to all the Imago community and our family and everyone and we changed our minds. <laughs> So, um, and that's because we got better at using the process. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we're being but, kind of monological now. So let's move back into dialogue. Yes, and hear, we, we really want to hear, hear from you. Hear, yeah, hear from you. I guess my first question is, and something that I feel that we've gone through at one time, and I'm sure many of our listeners have, is what happens if the very beginning of that dialogue doesn't go well, so for example, somebody comes in and says, hey, do you have time to talk? And the other partner says, no, not right now. And then that person feels maybe rejected because their partner isn't available to listen to them, even though, you know, I'm sure when they think about it, <laughs> they'll come to. Sarah, yes, that, that's a great question. That's a very good question. And that is why the instructions are when you say this is not a good time. You have to say when it is. Mm -hmm. If it's tomorrow afternoon, if you if if the person says, you, as you know, I've got a work project and I have to focus twenty four seven on this work project, and the top topic you want to talk about is very important, and um, I can't do it now, but tomorrow afternoon, and we can take whatever time you want or something where you do not make them feel deflected. Yeah, and I think the important thing to also say here is that that what we assume is that we teach couples that this is something, a way to have a conversation, so they agree to the process. Mm -hmm. Helen and I know about this, so if I come in the room and Helen says, well, I really can't talk right now, I know that's okay because she's going to say when she can talk, that might be in 10 minutes or two hours. And that if it's two hours, she will come and find me and say, now I'm available. So that you learn how to negotiate this so that you don't get into that um, of, of being uh, disappointing. Before we continue on, we're going to take a short break to tell you about our sponsors. Cozy Earth is a premium bamboo bedding and loungewear company that has now become the only bedding I will use for the rest of my life. When I received my new Cozy Earth sheets a few weeks ago, I was truly shocked at how easily you could tell the difference in quality compared to regular cotton sheets. It makes it really hard to get out of bed each day. They are so soft. They almost feel like silk. And Stella always asks why our sheets are so much softer than hers. So it's pretty common that she'll wake up in the morning and want to jump in bed with us for another 30 minutes or so. And we're totally okay with it because it's so comfortable. Cozy Earth's premium bedding wicks moisture. They are temperature regulating. And a huge bonus for me is that they are free of harsh chemicals and dyes. All of Cozy Earth's products are covered under a 10-year warranty, and they have thousands of five-star reviews. With Mother's Day right around the corner, Cozy Earth is the perfect gift to get that mama in your life. Or if you're a mom yourself, it's a great excuse to treat yourself. To get 40% off your order, visit CozyEarth.com and use the promo code IDOPODCAST at checkout. That's Cozy Earth, C-O-Z-Y, 
E-A-R-T-H dot com and use the promo code I do podcast at checkout to get 40% off. That's cozyearth.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Dipsy. We're excited about this one. This is interesting (laughs) and new. And if you love that amazing first date butterflies in your stomach type of feeling and you're looking for a little excitement on your terms, Dipsy can help you get in the mood with no date required. Whoa. How does that even happen? (laughs) Let us tell you. Dipsy is an audio app full of short, sexy stories and guided sessions that are designed to turn you on and help you get in touch with yourself. Their stories are relatable and immersive, so you feel like you are right there. And there truly is something for everyone, no matter what you're into. They add new content every week, so there's always more to explore. You can find stories about a spontaneous hookup with a hot stranger. Ooh. Interesting. <laughs> Getting closer with that sexy yoga instructor. That's interesting. <laughs> spin instructor. <laughs> or even stories about trying that new toy together. The guided sessions can help you unlock new confidence or heighten intimacy with your partner. So try a new way of getting turned on with Dipsy. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash I do. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to Dipsy, D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash I do. Dipsy stories.com slash I do. This is all so valuable and I want to continue with the, with the dialogue because I'm just writing down like all these <laughs> quotes uh, because it is a dialogue. Uh, I wanted to go back to you said when you're reaffirming what your partner said and and you said it in the way of given how you see things, what you said makes sense. And I understand that validation. Now, if our partner says something and they're complaining about something and you say, well, given how you're seeing this situation, that makes sense. But then what if what they're saying is completely off of, of what was actually going on in your opinion or, or what your intent was? At what point do you address that? Well, I think there, there, my response to that would be two things. And one is that as partners become more mature, and handling uh, difference is that I can say, well, I get that. I can see how you see it that way. And you make really make sense. Um, I uh, don't have to, uh, if I've evolved, uh, tell my point of view. Uh, I'm, I'm just learning. This is where my partner is. This is what she's experiencing. So that would be one way you could do it. The second way uh, in my perspective is that I could say, um, I get that. And, and that, that makes sense. Um, and I wonder if you're available for me to share with you how I see that. I don't have to agree with Helen to validate her. In fact, agreement has nothing to do with validation. Validation is I have to see her and see that that's Helen having that thought and seeing things that way. And I can ask her, are you available? And she might say, well, not right now. And I'd say, okay, well, if, if you, if you are interested or want to, or later, let me know. And I'll share with you what I think about that. And I think as couples mature that they don't compete for who is going to have the last word about reality. So Chase, your question is excellent because you're talking about an inflamed couple. Um, And, and, um, uh, I, th- I mean, that's how I take it. And we, I mean, all of us, even in good relationships, get aflame, inflamed occasionally. And um, the words I make, you make sense means the world to the person who just said something. Uh, from, you know, from your point of view, I get it. Though uh, I'll, I want to make a big picture comment because you, you advertise this as talking about the brain. If you live your marriage in the lower brain, which is the brain that keeps you alive and it's reactive, it's spontaneous, and it wants to protect you. There are positive things about the lower brain. And when our partner says something and we disagree, it could be on the subject that we get scared 
or, or we get furious and we are in the lower brain. When you use these sentence stems and you take turns talking, um, and we even suggest for a troubled couple that we alternate days where we listen to each other, like the first day of the month, the first, third, fifth, seventh, that that person really receives the words of the other and the even days of the month, uh, we will, con- you know, the, the person goes, quote, on duty to receive what the, their partner said the day before. Like, really take time. When you slow down, it puts you in the upper brain. And the upper brain is the part of the brain where you can collaborate, you cooperate, and you can co-create solutions that you didn't have at the beginning of the dialogue. If you're talking from the reactive part of the brain, it's my way or the highway. But in the upper brain, or, or I win, you lose. I'm right, you're wrong. I've got the answer, your answer stinks. And, and that's how a lot of relationships feel to a person who is sure they're right. But if you use these sentence stems, they usher you into the upper brain where maybe you, you think you're polarized, but if you continue the dialogue process, you can create a win-win where both of you feel heard and respected by the end of the dialogue. Beautiful. And, and that makes a lot of sense. So with that understanding, I, I like the two options you gave us, Harville. And let's say I say to my partner, I wonder if you're available for me to share how I see it. And they're like, nope. <laughs> and whatever it is that they said before, again, I'm not necessarily in this situation trying to win the conversation, but let's say they say something that's like the sky is green, you know, and we're trying to get to an objective reality, a shared reality. And they're, they're going on and on about the sky is green. And you're like, Hmm, given how you see things, <laughs> you see the sky is green. Uh, what you said makes sense, but I wonder if you're available for me to share how I see it. I see it as blue, but they're like, no, I'm not available. What what would you say to to both partners in in that situation? Because eventually, don't we need to work? We need to work towards mutual understanding, but an objective reality that is kind of not shared because we're different people, but but closer to the to the truth. So let me just say, Chase, if the person says um, that makes or or. Anyway, the situation where, where they they disagree um, because they look up and the sky is blue and their partner says it's green. Go on through the whole sentence stem process. Uh, um, after you say you 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 say that makes sense from your from the way you see things, and then you empathize um, the slowing down of things the person who has been adamant that the sky is green will will begin to relax their position of insisting they're right and you're wrong. And it'll calm them down for they would be willing to have another conversation yeah. at another time. And um, if not, they can call a safe conversation practitioner or an, a therapist. Um, so let, let me just uh, be a, a, do a specific on that uh, uh, that Helen has given the process. And I would say that if, you, if a person says, nope, um, nope, the guy's sky is green, uh, that you go back to mirroring. Mm-hmm. You're right. like, so if I'm getting this, right. the sky is green yeah. uh, for you. Is there more about that? Right. So Keep what you... Using the- Process. Yeah, what you want to do, yes, is keep using the process because the the person who is being um, uh, unavailable or whatever that term is, they're being uh, defensive or they're being provocative. Um, they uh, here here's, here's something that's really took me a long time to understand this. Everybody who's acting um, awful is just scared. And if I uh, scare them more by saying, well, the, the, your point of view, you know, if the sky is actually blue and anybody can see the sky is blue. It's not green. 
Uh, all I'm, what I've been doing is activating their amygdala. I'm increasing their scare. They may not even know they're scared. They may be covering their scare with anger or with competition or with uh, opposition uh, because they are feeling like they might be overcome. But if you stay with them, with their experiencing, so the sky is actually green for you. Can you tell me more about the, your green sky? As Helen said, what that does is regulate that person's affect, and it will also then start regulating their words. But you'll have to stay with it and, and stay out of competing or trying to get them to see things your way, because we call that the symbiotic impulse. I really want you to see it my way. And what, what all of us have to do is give up objective reality. There is no, we do not have access. There may be one, but we don't have access to it. Our brains are not designed. All we have is how it looks through our two eyes. Uh, and as, as those um, two eyes are organizing uh, the, uh, the light waves uh, in somewhere in the back of our brain, in the auditory system, all we have is what we see. And when we ab absolutize that, then we are, I think, pathological, which means all of us are pathological most of the time because we actually walk around with the illusion that we are living in objective reality. What we're living in is a consensual reality that Helen and I can agree enough um, that we can get in the same car or have dinner together or talk about something. But there's no way that uh, we can have the same reality. Our brains are not designed to do that. Um, so you don't have to teach all that to couples. But as you're working with couples, it's important to know that what you have to do when there is an opposition or a defiance is to hold that instead of becoming defiant to a defiant person is that you mirror the defiant person and that will uh, remove, it's, it's almost like, what, what is the category of things called yoga and pilates and uh, where there's movements and you're moving back and forth, Japanese, jujitsu, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of wisdom there in which, and when something moves at you with force, that you don't go against the force, that simply creates it. You lean with the force. So mirroring would be leaning with that. And what will happen and it always happens, is that the other person not having an opposition will relax their intention. It may not be instantly, but it will. And then the other thing is, then if you if you come back toward them, they're going to increase their belief and their position yeah. that it's green. Yeah. So you reinforce their position. But if you hold it, then they themselves can reconsider it. That makes sense. And that's a beautiful way to think about you know, leaning with the force, not being a wall against it. And then you're just colliding, right? Um, so with this dialogue that, that we've gone through, let's say we get to the place of, uh, I wonder if you're available for me to share how I see it. And then, and then that person shares, and then there's, there's mirroring and reflecting back and in that process. And then how does that dialogue wrap up? Well, it, you can decide on that. Sometimes it's just, okay, we both shared that I live in a blue world and you live in a green world. And I'm really glad to know that we have this difference and that I really honor your green and you honor my blue. And that's all we need is to what we call differentiate. We've got clear, uh, we have different skies. And now I live with a green sky person and she lives with a blue sky person. And we, neither one of us have to surrender our identity. Could be that we need to, that it's about something like where are kids going to go to college or who's going to go buy groceries. And then you can take it further and say, so now we've got that done. Uh, uh, can one of us uh, make a proposal? And this, I know this sounds really formal, but you can actually do it. One of us make a proposal about uh, where we're going to go from here around about dinner. And I have a suggestion. Um, and then you propose that and the person says, well, let's see, you have a suggestion, you're wanting Mexican food. Am I getting that? And you want so-and-so. So kind so of share with you what I'm thinking about tonight, which is maybe the Vietnamese restaurant across the street, but we can go back and forth. And what happens with that if there's no polarization 
is that it will settle on something that will be acceptable to both. So I want to go back to what we said at the beginning. When the relationship feels safe, two people can connect even if they totally disagree about several subjects. But there is a way using safe conversations to have completely different opinions and still stay connected. And, um, and so there, you know, there's several different ways to manage it. But again, one of them is uh, Harville and I were really helped and other couples have said this too, when we take turns being on duty uh, in the relationship and the person, quote, on duty, close quote, it means by the end of the day, the relationship is connected. So on the first day of the month, the third day of the month, the fifth, the seventh, the odd days of the month, I'm on duty. In my relationship, oh, you're, with you're the odd one, right? I've always been <laughs> odd. Been odd yeah, you're normal. I'm the even I one. I am odd. And the even <laughs> one, at the end of the second, the fourth, the sixth, the eighth, we may have had a big fight during the day, but that person who's on duty has to, before going to sleep at night, bring flowers, bring chocolates, bring offer to do a foot rub or say, you know, I know we had a big fight today, but can I give you a foot butt rub? I, I want to work it out. You know, uh, let's, let's keep working on the subject. I apologize for what I said earlier. And that way, both people are involved in making a healthy relationship. We love that. That's, we mm-hmm. have not heard a lot of this stuff before, but that's a unique one like a a check-in but the on duty and really just a great little hack and and tool for our listeners Mm -hmm. so and i'll say one more thing again what makes safety in the relationship and both people need to ask themselves am i being safe for my partner if if i if i am safer for my partner they're going to be willing to shift what they want to do and do do it my way. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. This is why the look on your eye, the tone of the voice, that is something Harv and I worked on. And wow, everything is so much different when when we have a um, that is um, called cinder responsibility. When you do talk to your partner, um, it it should be uh, succinct, uh, kind look in your eye, kind tone of voice. And this is where you can give your partner feedback uh, that, um, you know, can you say what you said, but could you say it with a kinder look in your eye? And then I'll be more receptive to what you're saying. Yeah. And to to follow on that, we have a a ritual about uh, creating safety, which is we call zero negativity. And the ritual is that uh, when couples decide that they're going to, Uh, engage in this process of what we call becoming conscious partners, that one of the things that they have to uh, do, they have to do this if they want safety is to give up negativity. Now that's like, you know, giving up sugar uh, in your diet because negativity is so seductive and so natural to the human brain to be a little paranoid, to be negative. But you can't be negative and safe at the same time. So when you ask the question, am I safe for my partner? What that means is I am only safe for my partner if I stop, remove any judgments that are negative judgments about her and expressing them to her. And eventually I let go all of my neg- negative thoughts about her that I don't even express because they're not functional, those thoughts. They are a part of, you know, our brains. I uh, think that there's a, a, a um, I'm having a hard time with names today, but there's a neuroscientist who talks about <clears throat> the fact that all of us have a negativity bias that comes from the long evolutionary history when um, before Gorgeous. we had, mm-hmm. no, before, before we had civilization, um, we lived in, you know, in unprotected areas and savannas and the forests and the plains 
So you couldn't imagine or you couldn't you couldn't assume that if someone or something approached you that that you would be safe with them. So you had to assume initially that it was a potentially dangerous situation. Um, and then if it turned out not to be, then you could engage them with positive social engagement. But that's built into the brain, that the brain always asks one question, am I going to die as a result of this interaction or will I be okay? And so that's there. So, but that, and, and, and that's not going to go away. But behaviorally, you can remove negative comments like, why did you do that? Or where did that come from? Or when is dinner going to be fixed? Or we never, or you always. And all of those things destroy safety. So we help couples understand the language they need to use in order to facilitate safety, i.e. their amygdala is not aroused with cortisol. Uh, but instead, they experience uh, something like endorphins and dopamine. Um, so the, which are the chemicals of connection. So we ask couples to make a commitment. In fact, we even ask them to sign a pledge, put their name on the paper, uh, that they will remove negativity from their lives. And if it's a, like a workshop, at least until the end of the workshop, uh, if it's in therapy, it's until the end of therapy, uh, then you can go back to your old ways. But we also tell them that when you go back to your old ways, you will go back to your old relationship. So you have to make this decision. Without safety, your relationship will suck. And if with safety, you can have the relationship of your dreams. And it's a sacri- we call it a sacrifice, that you have to sacrifice the indulgence in judgment uh, and change it to affirmation, curiosity and affirmation. Then you'll feel safe, and then you'll connect, and then you'll be living uh, with full aliveness and joy. Well. That is a great note to wrap this up on. And we would love to just continue to talk to you guys and (laughs) dig into all this amazing knowledge and work that you've done. But we have to let you go. And we want to thank you again so much for all the work that you've done and for coming on the show and sharing this information. So before we wrap up, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find out more information about Safe Conversations and if there's anything you want to leave our listeners with, and then we'll say goodbye. Okay, there are two websites. One is mine and Helen's personal one called harvelandhelen.com. And that puts people in touch with what we do with couples, which are weekend uh, intensive workshops. The second thing we do is um, is work with Safe Conversations, which we created. And that website is safeconversations.com. And that's where you go if you want to go to a, a workshop uh, or you want to become a trainer and teach this material to your ecosystem, uh, whatever that ecosystem might be, your own family or it might be a church, or you might want to you might want to become a trainer and um, uh, and it become your income. So you could teach it to corporations and congregations and wherever you wanted to do that. And we help you do that. So those are the two things, conversations.com and harvillandhelen.com. Wonderful. Well, we'll have the links to both those websites on the show notes and on our website. And again, thank you to so much for taking the time to join us on the show. Well, we are delighted to be asked and is, we appreciate you. It is a true joy to get to talk to both of you, Chase and Sarah. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show, guys. As always, the links will be in the podcast description as well as on the show notes on our website at I Do Podcast. Dot com. And while you're on our website, we hope you guys check out our free 14 day happy couple challenge. Uh, it's a challenge where we send you a daily email for 14 days with easy, doable challenges to help strengthen and improve your relationship. And it's honestly just a whole lot of fun to do with your partner. It's something new and we think you guys will really enjoy it. So check it out. And while you're on the website, there are tons of free resources as well as more information about our online course, Spark My Relationship, where our listeners can get $100 off. So check that out. You can go directly to the course website at Spark 
myrelationship.com slash unlock. And that's where you can get the $100 off. So thank you guys for tuning in and we'll see you next week.